So we're so grateful for them as well. And so um, uh, before I get uh, started this morning, let's go to God in a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll uh, get right into this morning's uh, lesson. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today, God. Father, we thank you for this incredible opportunity that we have to worship you together, to sing together, to learn from your word together, to pray together, God. Father, I pray that uh, at this moment, God, that you uh, could put off whatever may be distracting us, and God, that we could listen intently to your voice, God. Father, you have this uh, incredible ability to touch each and every heart. Uh, simultaneously, God, I pray that you speak to us, Father, that you really touch our hearts this morning. God, I pray that every word that I speak, that it could be according to your spirit, Lord. Father, that you will use this time to help us to draw near to you, to help us to understand you better. Father, that we can live productive spiritual lives that will bring you glory and honor. God, we thank you so much for this time again. We pray all this in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And this morning what I'd like to talk about is a genuine faith. And, uh, you know, a genuine faith is one of those things that we all say we either have or really, really want. See, but at times, there are things that we believe in theory, but not in practice. You know, the idea of theory and practice is something great minds have thought about and debated about for many, many years. Aristotle, great philosopher, often spoke of the difference between theory and practice. You know, theory and practice could, uh, could be kind of funny sometimes. You know, for example, if I go out to buy a pair of shoes and I see a sale, buy two pairs of shoes and get one free. Well, in theory, that's a great sale. In practice, I just bought two pairs of shoes I didn't need or want. You know, in theory, I get haircuts. In practice, I'm getting a glorified shave. Uh, in theory, we observe all traffic laws. In practice, let's be real, not so much. In theory, uh, Tom Brady was innocent of deflating those footballs. Hope there's no New England Patriot fans in the audience. Uh, we're pretty far south there. Uh, but, you know, we know that's probably not the case. Um, in theory, there are 2.1 billion Christians in the world. Unfortunately, in practice, we know better. You know, in theory, we all believe in discipling. In practice, many times we're just too busy. In theory, we believe Jesus is Lord, and we'll say it proudly. In practice, it depends. See, we could believe in theory many great things, but in practice, what is it that we're really living out? I believe in theory, we all say we want and we have perhaps even a genuine faith. But often, we're simply not willing to go through the things that we need to in order to have that genuine faith. And we're going to be looking at genuine faith this morning and the role that trials play in really developing a genuine faith. And when this morning's text, we're going to be reading out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. You can start turning there, but we'll have it right on the screen behind me there so you could follow along. And uh, we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. The Bible says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you 
who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. We can go to the next slide and keep reading in verse 7. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, a greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know, it says that a genuine faith fills us with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I love that because it doesn't just say it fills you with joy. It says it fills you with an inexpressible and glorious joy. That's what God wants to fill us with if we would have a genuine faith. But in order to have a genuine faith, well, this one thing we really have got to understand, and the first thing we've got to understand is that a genuine faith is greater than gold. A genuine faith is greater than gold. And you can go to the next slide. Gold is precious and valuable. And yet the Bible says that a genuine faith is of greater worth than gold. But maybe you're not into gold. Maybe you don't really grasp what that all means. Well, the truth is you can replace that word, word gold with the things that you value in this world. Money, career, selfish ambition, maybe even worldly relationships. Whatever it is that you wake up thinking about that you're chasing, those things that you're going after, the Bible says that a genuine faith is greater than all of it. Or maybe it's a little bit more subtle for you. Maybe those first few things don't really hit. Maybe it's control. Maybe you live a life seeking control. Or maybe it's comfortability. I want to be comfortable. I want to be free of grief or, or trials of any kind. I want to make sure everything is good, everything is at peace. And I'm going to value that more than a genuine faith. See, we have to understand that a genuine faith is of greater worth than any of these things. Because if you don't see it the way God does... Boy, you are set up for a very difficult time in this world. If you set your sights and your hope and your happiness on the things of this world, you are set up to lose. Your faith, your genuine faith is of greater worth than gold or anything in this world that you may be chasing this morning. Your faith is greater than it all. And I, I want to ask you this question. I know that we believe that. We'll read that. We all agree. But I want to ask you, is that reflected in your life? What matters to you most? What do you spend the majority of your time thinking about? What do you worry about? What do you go after the most? What do your priorities reflect? See, because we could believe it in theory, all we want. I want a genuine faith. But in practice, what are we really living? What really is reflected by how we live our daily lives? 
You know, genuine faith or a lack of genuine faith will reflect in the decisions that you make. For example, when we don't have a genuine faith, we get really clear on what we're not going to do. Let me give you an example. We say, well, I'm not going to sacrifice like I did before because it was not appreciated the way I thought it should. We say, I'm not going to trust people like I did before because when I did, I got burned. We say, I'm not going to seek and save the lost like I did before because in the past, I was mostly motivated out of guilt. We say, I'm not going to dream big dreams for God or even set goals because when I did, I just ended up disappointed. And that list can go on and on and on. We could continue to say, I am not, I am not, I am not, without realizing that our Christianity is becoming defined by what we won't do. You end up so clear on what you're not going to do that you forget, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to be about? What will you do for God? See, God is the I am, not the I am not. Our faith cannot be defined solely by what we're not going to do. That's religion based on fear rather than relationship based on faith. Imagine starting your day with a not-to-do list. I mean, think about that. And then deciding, I'm going to live by this not-to-do list. How productive would that be? How inspiring would your day really be? Would you be excited about that day? Well, I wrote a whole list of stuff I'm not going to do today. But that's what it's like when our faith isn't genuine. It's based off of circumstances and are things going the way I want them to. And this is what happens. We get trapped in this mode of what we're not going to do. It spills into our prayer life. So our prayer lives are like, God, take this way. I don't want to do this. God, I can't do this. I don't want that. It spills into our hearts and it just permeates through all the decisions that we make. When we seek to have a genuine faith, it will reflect in our decisions. But we've got a value having a genuine faith. We've got a value because I'm telling you, it's going to get hard when you start to face life's disappointments and life's struggles. It gets difficult. You have got to really value a genuine faith the way God does. Not the way I'm telling you. I'm talking about the way God does. We've got to align ourselves according to the scriptures when we think about our faith. Do I value my faith as God does? We must value it if we're really going to have the type of genuine faith that brings out that life that God wants. You know, the second thing that I think we've really got to look at is, is how our faith is actually proven genuine. You know, in, in verse 6, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you, admit you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come to make your life miserable. No, that's not what it says. It says, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined, by fire. What is it there? These trials are there to prove your faith genuine. See, suffering and trials come into our lives in order to prove whether our faith is genuine or, or to turn in our faith into a genuine faith. You know, and he mentions here about uh, being refined by fire. And uh, in Malachi 3.3, you don't need to turn there. You can go to the next slide. Um, we read in Malachi 3.3 about, you know, God sitting as a refiner and purifier of silver over his people. 
And, you know, here's the truth. We may not like it at the time. I know I don't. But God uses suffering to refine us and to make us more like Jesus. See, when we value genuine faith the way God does, suffering is viewed very differently. When you don't value a genuine faith, suffering takes on a very worldly perspective for us. But when we truly value genuine faith, we look at suffering different. This is an opportunity that God is going to use however uncomfortable it is to help me to be more like Jesus. You know, there's a story, I'm not sure how totally accurate or no, how true it is, but it's, it's a very great illustration. And because in the scripture it talks about using this illustration of a refiner, how he refines silver. And uh, there's a story called the refiner's fire. And I'll read it to you. It says, there was a group of women in a Bible study on the book of Malachi. As they were studying chapter 3, they came across verse 3, which says, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. This verse puzzled the women. And they wondered what this statement meant about the character and nature of God. One of the women offered to find out about the process of refining silver and get back to the group at their next Bible study. That week, the woman called up a silversmith and made an appointment to watch him at work. She didn't mention anything about the reason for her interest in silver beyond her curiosity about the process of refining silver. As she watched the silversmith, he held a piece of silver over the fire and let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest so as to burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse that he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it was true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time the silver was being refined. The man answered, yes. He not only had to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire. For if the silver was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. The woman was silent for a moment. Then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? He smiled at her and answered, oh, that's the easy part. When I see my image reflected in it. God refines us. See, the truth is, if we're being honest, we often fight the fire. I don't want it. Now listen, maybe some of you spiritual juggernauts in here embrace it. I, I know I don't. If you embrace suffering, you could take a nap for the rest of the way. For the rest of us, for the rest of us that struggle with the idea that I have to suffer, that I have to go through trials, you know, that, that's just not fun. And if I have a worldly perspective on it, I'm never going to get out of it what I could. We often fight that fire. And yet God is saying, I'm trying to use this fire to make you more like me. See, we say, I want to be like Jesus. In theory, that's all fine and dandy. But if part of that practice is I've got to engage and take on suffering, well, can we figure out a different way? See, we all want to be like Jesus, but we don't want to go through the, the refining process that it takes 
to be like Jesus. You know, I always read this passage. I like, I like to read this in Philippians 3, and you don't need to turn there. I just want to read it to you because it's just kind of an illustration. It says in, in Philippians 3, uh, verse 10, it says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Man, don't we wish verse 10 ended right there. But it continues. He says, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so that somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. If we're honest, we can read this plainly, but in our hearts, here's how we read it. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, we can keep his eyes. In our hearts, that's how it's really being played out. We could read it boldly, but in our hearts, I want to know Christ. Sufferings, can we just leave that to the side? That's what happens. We don't want to be refined, and yet God wants to refine us. So what are we to do? Are we to keep fighting God, refining us? Or do we embrace what we say and we all believe that we want to be like Jesus. It's part of the process. You want a genuine faith? You're going to have to go through some trials. You're going to have to suffer. Trials are difficult, but absolutely necessary to grow. You know, athletes train not to wear themselves out or destroy themselves, but to make themselves better and stronger. See, we see it played out in so many different arenas. We understand that a struggle, a trial can make us stronger. We just don't want it played out in our lives. As long as it happens to somebody else, you know, oh, I can see it from far. I'm good. You know, William Barclay writes about this, and you can go to the next slide. It'll be on the screen. It says, in this world, trials are meant not to take the strength out of us but to put the strength into us. That is absolutely the case. You want to be more like Jesus? You are going to be refined. That struggle will make you stronger. God sits as that refiner. He looks at that silver. He's looking intently at you because he's never going to let you stay a second more than you need. But because he loves you, he's not going to take you out a second too soon either. Now listen, we might not all like that. It might not be great at the time. But listen, if you look back at your life, I, I, I say it for myself, my moments of struggle and suffering have made me a better man. I've learned some of the deepest lessons I've ever learned in my life through struggle, through hardship. Now listen, I'm just like you. I wouldn't want to learn it that way, but unfortunately, I don't think I would learn it unless I experienced it, unless I got to see it with my own eyes. This is the struggle that refines us. And then you, if you look back and you look back at your Christian life and you see different times, you know, for me, I remember difficult moments. And being so unhappy in the moment and even blaming God in the moment and asking God, where are you in the moment? And then looking back years later and saying, thank you, God. Thank you. Because I, when I said, Jesus, Lord, I really meant it. When I got in the waters of baptism, I wanted to be like Jesus. I, I not only said he was Lord, I really meant it. And I wasn't going to bail out on God when he's trying to make me what I wanted all along. But that's how you get a genuine faith. You know, in verse 6, it talks about all kinds of trials. So you know what? This fits anything you may be going through. Whatever kind of trial, all kinds of trials God uses to help give us a genuine faith. You know, the Greek word, and uh, all kinds is uh, poikilos. And Peter used that word only one other time. Right up there on the screen. It's in 1 Peter 4.10 when he says, God's grace in its various forms. 
So when you combine these thoughts, we go in through these times of struggle. Remember this, God has all kinds of grace for all kinds of trials. There's not a situation that you will be in that God is not prepared with a grace to get you through it. There's not a struggle that he's not prepared to carry you through. There's not a struggle that he's not prepared to turn around and use it for your good. You know what? Things happen at times to us where people intend to hurt us. But like Joseph said, you know, what others may intend, may use to intend to hurt us, God will use for good. And God has a way of turning things back around and transforming us to be more like Jesus. You've been wrong. You've been betrayed. Guess what? You've got something in common with Jesus. You've been mistreated. You've got something in common with Jesus. See, God has grace to match every trial that you could ever experience. See, in the moment, we don't want those trials. But God is transforming us. You know, when you learn through these trials, you look back and you realize, you know what? I'm so grateful I learned something. So that difficulty wasn't just a wasted time. You know, it's funny. When we go through trials and we learn something from it, it kind of gives a, a sense of dignity to what we've been through. Don't allow suffering and trials to move on through your life without you getting out of it what God wants you to get out of it. Listen, I, I know I'm the first one at the line. It might not be the way I want to learn, but let's be honest. Some of us are hard-headed. Let's be real, we're hard-headed. We don't really get that one conversation that that brother or sister had with us. They told us this, but we don't really get it. And every single one of us has a button. Listen, I trust God. But there's certain buttons in my life that if they get pushed, I become non-Christian really quick. I, I'm just keeping it real. I hate to disappoint you if you were looking at me funny, but uh, that's just the truth. There's certain buttons where I just, I kick into another gear. I get into my Brooklyn ghetto mindset. Okay, now I'm getting real here now. It, it just, I just kick, I don't decide it, it just happens. Okay, and listen, I'm saying this as a confession. I, I'm not totally proud of that, but that, that's just reality. Thank you, Jesus, for his grace. Because there are many times when things don't go right, I want to take matters into my own hands. You know, I, I always share this story. Uh, I, one of my kids was being bullied in school. I'll, I'll, I'll leave their name out because they're here and they're going to get bitter at me after this. Uh, but one of my kids was getting bullied. And you know what I did? I did what I, any parent would do that came from my background. I went to school when they were in the fourth grade. And I found out what time recess was. And I went to recess. And there was a gate there. And I stood on that gate. I was giving them nine-year-olds them dirty looks. Like, who's going to mess with my kid? Who's going to mess with my kid? I showed those nine-year-olds. They knew never to mess with my kid again. See, I, I could get really, I get crazy when certain buttons are pushed. I wish I could tell you, man, I just handled it so spiritually, and I went back into my war room that I didn't have and started praying. It didn't happen that way. It did not happen that way. But you know what? If I want to have a genuine faith, I need to learn to have that way. I need to learn to fight the battles the way God wants me to fight them. See, it's easy to trust God when things are going well. When times are tough, then you really see if you trust God or not. I mean, who wants a fair-weather friend that's only with you when things are great? How can we be that way with God when times are tough? I start bailing and think I've got better answers. That's my struggle, and I know I've got to crucify that if I really want a genuine faith. Again, in theory, I've always wanted a genuine faith, 
But in practice, if I really want it, I've got to really embrace this. You know, and it, uh, the passage really closed out talking about, you know, what's the point of all this? You know, we go through different struggles, but ultimately, nothing we go through in this world is going to match the inheritance that we're going to have in heaven. You can go to the next slide. We each have an inheritance kept in heaven for each one of us. And, you know, this is when, you know, you can read those passages that make you really kind of struggle. Uh, you know, you're going through some momentary and light troubles. I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. You know, I, that, that's not what I feel. But the truth is, and this is what's so key about viewing things from God's perspective. Your bad week does not register next to eternity in heaven. Your bad month, your bad year does not register as a blip on the screen compared to eternity in heaven. And you know what's great? We don't have to rush to get there. It will never perish spoil, or fade. No one's going to slip in and take your piece of the inheritance. It will not diminish over time. It's being kept there for you. God guards it as your inheritance and even gives us his Holy Spirit as a deposit for it so that we know it's yours. It's yours if you hold on. It's all about getting to heaven. I know it might seem like it's about your struggle. And I know it might seem like you're the only one struggling. And I know it might seem like, why am I going through this? But it's about getting to heaven. And at times there are things that need to get worked out of our character if we're going to make it there. And it might not get worked out in a simple conversation. It might get worked out when you're flat on your face, begging God for mercy. Sometimes that's how it has to get worked out. But those struggles are momentary and light compared to eternity with God. You know, sometimes our struggles seem so much bigger than they really are. When they're in front of us, it's like, Wow, this is the worst situation ever in the history of mankind, and why do I have to deal with it? And yet God's like, really? Are you serious? Let, let, let me help you out here. You know, our worst day as Christians, we still something, have something incredible ahead. On our worst day, our absolute worst day, we have a hope beyond this world. On our worst day, on our worst day, we can look forward to being with God in heaven. No more tears. I always throw this in. No more bills either, right? No more disease. No more death. We get to just be with God. Ever. You know, if we really learn to view suffering the way that God does. Now, listen, I, I know when we're not robots, it's going to be difficult, but you always got to remember, however big your problem seems, however unique it may seem to you, remember, Jesus walks on the things you drown in. What you might be destroyed by or overwhelmed by, Jesus routinely walks on it. That's who we serve. And that's who God is trying to turn us into. He's trying to see that reflection. That when he looks at me and you, he can look and see his son. But we've got to desire that genuine faith. We've got to desire it. We've got to see how truly valuable it is. We've got to see it the way God sees it. 
We've got to see that that genuine faith is going to be molded and is going to be proven through trials of many kinds. But whatever they may be, they just won't match up to being in heaven for all eternity. Thank you, guys. God bless.